Good morning and welcome to the Cosmic Influence. I'm Walter Cruttenden here with Filiberto. Filiberto Mendoza. And we're the guys that uh, work at the Binary Research Institute and we're looking at the cause and consequences of solar system motion. And we believe that one of the causes is cycles, cycles of time. So just as the Earth spins on its axis, it gives you the cycle of day and night, or the Earth uh, goes around the sun uh, in its orbit, and it gives you the cycle of the seasons. So too did some believe that uh, the whole solar system moving uh, through space results in an even longer cycle. And uh, so we like to interview people that know something about this topic from one angle or another. And so we're Super excited today to have Marco Vigato, author, researcher, explorer, uh, join the show. And so, Marco, hi there. Thank you, Walker and Filiberto. Very nice to be on the show. Um, Marco, I, I know that you recently wrote uh, Empires of Atlantis, and I like the fact that the uh, word empires is plural there. It's going to lead us in all sorts of directions. And so, uh, but I also love the fact that you're actually from an Ivy League school and have a real practical experience in your background, uh, something that's not always, you know, you don't always find in the metaphysical world. And so uh, tell us first kind of how you got on this track, because, you know, it's not your mainstream Ivy League subject. No, no, it isn't. Uh, I would say it's uh, since... Uh... Pretty much as far as I remember, I was fascinated uh, by archaeology, by ancient civilizations. So with my father being an archaeologist, uh, I was uh, on uh, excavation sites, uh, visiting archaeological sites pretty much throughout uh, all of Europe, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, for much of my childhood. And that uh, stayed as a passion of mine. Uh, so now I've been uh, researching uh, the question of the origins of civilization for the past uh, 15 years or so, having traveled across uh, five continents. Uh, just about uh, seven years ago, I moved to Mexico. That's where I live uh, right now to continue my research uh, here in Mexico. Much of my research actually focuses on uh, the origin of Mesoamerican civilization. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to digging into that because I really haven't studied that part of the world that much, even though I'm so close to it. Uh, but how interesting that your father was an archaeologist. Uh, so you got got to be sort of steeped in the discipline early on. Um, but Atlantis, you know, your latest writings here is is not a mainstream archaeology topic. Uh, what it, what does he think about you looking at, <laughs> at that sort of thing? I think we have, a, I, I would say, a very open debate, a very open conversation on this topic. He has been with me to many archaeological sites uh, all over the world. Uh, and I think uh, uh, one, of the, one of the issues that you find in the field of archaeology is that you have uh, a number of specialists who are just uh, focused on uh, very small area, perhaps, or a very small uh, aspect of the whole problem. So many of these people, they end up missing what they think is the bigger picture of uh, the origin of the development of uh, civilization. But it's actually quite eye-opening for people like uh, my father, many more academically trained archaeologists. So you're actually confronted with evidence that you cannot explain under any mainstream or, let me say, academically accepted or recognized uh, model. And I do think in any case uh, that there is a, a paradigm shift uh, that is taking place. You know, Walter, you have been also championing this idea of a paradigm shift uh, in the study of the origins of civilization. And uh, as usual with scientific revolutions, uh, this will take time. So I don't expect uh, the paradigm to shift overnight, uh, but uh, I'm sure that that will happen hopefully within our lifetimes. I I think you're right. I, I hope it is in our lifetimes. And it's a wonderful debate. You know, we need both. We we need people thinking of these big questions that, that kind of give some context uh, to these many ancient civilizations we're finding all around the world. And we need the, the guys that are actually putting, you know, shovels in the sand, in the earth, and and coming up with, you know, good evidence of exactly what was there and when it was there and that sort of thing. So... I'm excited to, to to hear more of this debate. As you probably know, right after we speak at the conference on procession and ancient knowledge in October, 
uh, Graham is going on the Joe Rogan show and he's going to be debating Flint Dibble actually on this, this yeah. sort of very topic. Was there an ancient global civilization? And if so, what is the evidence? Yeah, it's a debate I'm really looking forward to. Likewise, likewise. So, hey, let's dig into uh, to some of your work. I, I did uh, see your uh, beautifully uh, done video on YouTube, uh, which makes the five points about Atlantis. And, and I like that structure. So, you know, we don't need to get into everything done there, but um, let's start with some of the myths uh, about Atlantis and and sort of what's your take on them that because yeah, my understanding is there's pretty scanty evidence out there about Atlantis per se, but there seems to be wide evidence about some higher age culture that's unnamed. Right. No, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, of course, uh, most uh, um, scholars, uh, most researchers uh, who have focused on the Atlantis story they almost invariably go back to Plato's account uh, of Atlantis. But this is only one of many accounts. You now, if we extrapolate uh, the basic message, the basic content of Plato's accounts, it's essentially the story of a high civilization that uh, through hubris uh, essentially fell into decadence uh, and was destroy so that civilization effectively had to start over again. Uh, however, if you read Plato's account carefully, Plato never states that Atlantis was the only lost civilization, nor that it was the last. There is almost a sense uh, that uh, there were multiple cycles of civilization. Atlantis was uh, essentially just the last cycle immediately before our own. And I think that this is a very important point uh, that he also stress uh, in my book, and that's the reason why I I titled the book The Empires of Atlantis in plural, uh, not just the one single empire, almost as if suggesting that there were multiple Atlantean civilizations, multiple advanced civilizations in our remote past. And Atlantis is probably the latest or the most recent episode in that long series of cycles of civilization. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Hamlet's Mill by Giorgio de Santayana and Hertha von Deschen and uh, you know, they do this wonderful uh, job of looking all, at all this myth and folklore um, about world ages. And there's there's hints of, you know, higher culture, higher ages, higher consciousness, whatever you want to call it, in some of these. Um, uh, what's your take on, uh, on the, the mythology of, about these? lost cultures. Mm -hmm. I think this is something you find uh, pretty much in every culture around the world. Uh, so uh, almost every culture, every civilization has a story about either a great flood or cycles of civilization that involved uh, cataclysms uh, that involved uh, a former golden age, uh, and then uh, a resurrection or rebirth of a civilization in the aftermath of uh, these uh, cataclysms. Now, certain civilizations have it uh, much more codified. I dedicate uh, one entire chapter of the book uh, to various uh, king's lists uh, and the chronologies uh, from oh, ancient yeah. cultures, includes, for instance, uh, ancient Egyptian king's list, uh, Babylonian king's list, uh, element of Mesoamerican chronology as well. Because um, I think these uh, cycles really help under understand both uh, the depth uh, of these cycles of civilization that stretch back in some cases, uh, uh, not just thousands, but literally tens of thousands of years. Uh, and also uh, help us see the connections, the correlations. Uh, you are citing, uh, for instance, the excellent work of uh, Giorgio Santillan and Hertha Foundation, the Hamlet's Mill, that also point to these, uh, I think they call it a glass Berlin spiel. So these are like a connection between apparently uncorrelated elements. So when you find similar traditions around the world, similar chronologies pointing to the same time periods, uh, the same general cycles, of time across civilizations that supposedly never have or never should have had any connections with each other. I think that's a pretty strong evidence that there is a truly something up there that these ancient civilizations were up to. Yes, yes, I agree. You know, you mentioned uh, the the king's list, um, and it's, it correlates somewhat with the Chinese dynastic records, some of the old Persian records, right. some of the references, e even in the Bible, that uh, that we find 
long, long ago, people lived to be very old ages. And I actually found a book uh, that uh, Newton looked at this topic. And, you know, in his time, what the average lifespan was something like 42 or 43. And so he just couldn't conceive of people living to be, you know, hundreds of years old. And, uh, and so his assumption, being the logical guy that he was, was that all these ancient cultures were lying just to make their own civilizations look greater. Uh, yet it's it's interesting how uniform uh, it is, you know, uh, that that they all say in in whatever was a golden age or a long long ago time that people lived to be uh, such ripe old ages. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, something that uh, um, I'm sure you're very familiar with, particularly if we look at uh, the Babylonian, the Sumerian kings, they said appear to correlate very closely to the processional cycle. Many of the numbers that appear in those lists uh, actually are direct uh, fractions uh, of uh, the processional cycles, so including numbers like the number 72, 2160, uh, 144, and so on. So uh, there is a very strong sense that these are uh, King's list, maybe part historical document, but also part cosmology. So, so uh, it's uh, it's it's something that uh, it's always difficult to take at face value, particularly when we see uh, lengths of reign, as you mentioned, of hundreds or thousands of years. But if we interpret those lists uh, as uh, not referring to actual dynasty, but rather cycles of time, uh, perhaps related to astronomical cycles, to the cycle of procession, I think these documents make a lot more sense. It also help us understand why these lists would correlate uh, across civilizations uh, uh, in very different parts of the world. Right, right. Very, very good point. I didn't mean to imply that everyone lives to be, you know, thousands of years old in higher times. Um, although, uh, you know, some of the, I, I do think lifespans tend to be longer when people really live in tune with nature, which seems to be one of the hallmarks of, uh, yeah. you know, so-called golden age. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, moving from some some of the myths, uh, you you mentioned that you look at historical traditions of of cycles too, and uh, you know that's that's my favorite topic. So please uh, let me know where you first came across this idea of a larger cycle than than just the the day or the year. Mm -hmm. and and how that impressed you that there might be some a reality to it yes yeah, figure that many civilizations have these up uh, idea of uh, cyclical time uh, essentially in which there were different uh, cycles of a civilization if we think about uh, the ancient greeks uh, this idea of a golden age a silver age age of bronze uh, age of heroes uh, and uh, down to the iron age uh, the yuga cycles in in india so it's, uh, it's very surprising in a way to find very similar traditions for instance uh, in uh, in mesoamerica in mesoamerica in ancient mexico you have uh, these uh, uh, Legend of the Sun, so which is a very right. similar account in which you had essentially five different cycles of civilization that all ended in some sort of cataclysm, after which uh, a new cycle began. Uh, and uh, these are once again like suggests uh, this idea that our civilization uh, may not be the first. Uh, there may have been previous civilizations, uh, potentially even uh, advanced, uh, if not necessarily technologically, at least scientifically or culturally advanced uh, civilizations before our own uh, that perished uh, in some sort of terrestrial or cosmic cataclysm. So that civilization had to start over again. This is a cycle that may have repeated itself over and over again, uh, uh, many, many times. So, and uh, um, I think this is actually something uh, uh, that uh, correlates with the archaeological evidence that we find in many parts of the world. When uh, the more and the further down we dig into the past, uh, the more evidence we find, not of primitive societies, but of complex societies that already possess a high level of culture, a high level of civilization, which to me suggests that uh, the process of cultural evolution is never a linear process, but it goes through ups and downs or phases of um, greater uh, flourishing followed by ages of darkness. And that cycle may have repeated itself dozens of times throughout human history. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, 
it's persistent persistent in myth and folklore and of course uh what you mentioned about often these civilizations ending with some sort of catastrophe um is also mentioned in plato's works you know it's it's often with a great fire or great flood or something like that yeah um you know i obviously that held that belief isn't held wide widely in uh, amongst academics uh, but i really don't blame them because without a real obvious cause for a cycle you know it's it's hard to just say it something overrides darwinian evolution you know um and that's of course one reason we do the work here at binary research institute because we think there are very significant observable causes for a cycle um but that part of the whole uh this whole look into ancient cultures hasn't really been flushed out yet and so uh, i'm excited to see more clarity come to that, that i issue. think there is definitely a lot that can come from uh, archaeological research uh, if you think about that uh, 20 years ago nobody had even heard about gobekli tepe and now has been has literally taken the field of archaeology by storm and i think uh, gobekli tepe is a really good example of uh, what i was mentioning uh, that uh, the farther back we look into the past uh, the more we find evidence of uh, seemingly advanced uh, sophisticated uh, civilization again not necessarily talking about technologically advanced society but culturally spiritually uh maybe even scientifically the advanced uh, society. So I think that should uh, make us question this paradigm, paradigm of a constant linear evolution of civilization. Even if we look at the last uh, three or 4,000 years, so just what we would consider as uh, the known history, we have many examples of that where civilizations rise and fall. If you think about the fall of the Roman Empire, the fall of the Mayas, which literally reset uh, the clock of history by hundreds of years, in some cases, even thousands of years. Yes, yes, without a doubt. Um, and of course, there seems to be that, you know, a lot of different cultures flourished uh, prior to the Dark Ages and themselves went dark. You know, you can right. look at the Indus Valley, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, fantastic city complexes, very, uh, you know, indoor plumbing, heating, municipal sewer systems, things like this. And it's, you know, by the time of the Dark Ages, it's it's guys hanging out in tents, uh, building stuff with the ruins. And, uh, you know, same thing if you go to Mesopotamia, you know, it's uh, it's just nomads by the time of the, the Dark Ages. And, and it's interesting, this new evidence uh, somewhat, you know, highlighted with the, the LIDAR findings in, in Mexico and Guatemala mm -hmm. uh, show that Oh, this even in the Western Hemisphere, this was a much larger mm -hmm. uh, than we thought, and probably uh, sophisticated at an earlier date than we thought. And I wanted to ask you about that because that's your area of expertise. W what are you seeing on on the extent of the civilization and the datings of the civilizations in Mes Mesoamerica? Yeah, in Mesoamerica, I think uh, there is a, a great mystery that surrounds the origins of Mesoamerican civilization. Um, the concerns, particularly the Olmecs, which are still widely considered to be the mother culture of uh, Mesoamerica. Uh, and this is, I think, a problem that is, has been like uh, very well uh, um, portrayed uh, by Michael Coe, who was uh, one of the dean of uh, Maya studies, uh, when in uh, uh, facing this question of the origins of Mesoamerican civilization, he was faced with a puzzle that the farther one looked back into the past of Mesoamerica, one would expect things to become like simpler, more formative. In fact, uh, things are just getting more complex. So it's right. quite the other way around and now we know for instance you mentioned this research in Guatemala there has been incredible research in the Mirador Basin in the Petén region of Guatemala uh, that has uh, shown that uh, already in the first millennium uh, BC when people essentially believed that, that uh, no organized civilization existed in uh, in the area it was long before the flourishing of the classic Maya there were already immense cities like El Mirador for instance that flourished yes 
600 BC on a scale much larger than any classic Maya city. And that was a, a full thousand years before the flourishing of places like Tikal, for instance, not to mention Palenque or Chichen Itza. It only came uh, much, much later. So uh, there is this, uh, this feeling almost that the further back you take into the past, the more complex, the more sophisticated things become. And that the same may be said also with the Olmecs. Uh, uh, and just to set things clear, um, 100 years ago, nobody had even ever heard about the Olmecs. Uh, they were, uh, it's, so it's only been a very, very, a very short period of time that these great civilization have uh, officially entered into the landscape, into the picture of Mesoamerican civilization. And as I said, right now, most archaeologists uh, would consider the Olmecs to be the mother culture of Mesoamerica. But the reality is that I think there are many other cultures uh, that may be older than the Olmecs and probably better candidates uh, to that role of being the mother culture of, uh, of Mesoamerica. Think about the overall timeline of civilization in the new world. Uh, we have a very early development uh, uh, of beginning of civilization. The new world, uh, particularly central Mexico, was one of the cradles of agriculture, where you have crop domestication, animal domestication as early as 10,000 years ago. So pretty much at the same time as crop domestication happened in Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, in the Indus Valley or China. But then you have a huge gap, uh, basically almost until 1,000 in BC, in which uh, there is a seeming absence of archaeological evidence, uh, basically until the flourishing of the Olmecs. So that is the time period that I'm really interested in, and just uh, uh, exploring uh, that gap uh, and uh, trying to understand whether it's really a gap or it is because we haven't quite found the evidence yet of these cultures, of these civilizations. Yes, it could be that, that we haven't yet found it. And it could be that if it is indeed a higher culture, you know, perhaps they they chose to live closer to nature, uh, have a much lighter footprint on Mother Earth, right? And uh, and we're not going to find, you know, mm -hmm. sig significant, uh, mm -hmm. you know, concrete structures, uh, although we might find, you know. Uh, ways of living as our own science advances i think we'll we'll realize uh some things how ancients could have lived far more in tune with nature and had many of the benefits that we now get out of hard technology you know there's there's one uh, speaker who's uh come to cpac a few times uh john daring and he's a physicist and and he's uh he's sort of uh, has a just a wonderful perspective that technology kind of mimics uh, mm -hmm. some natural capabilities that mankind has or that the earth has. And uh, he would go so far as to say, you know, that, that uh, the antenna of insects uh, can, you know, uh, might be electromagnetically sensitive. Uh, it's, they're not just kicked, picking up chemicals that trees themselves can, uh, you know, if you had a, a strong enough computer uh, and software, of course, then you could actually pick up what the tree is picking up or that rocks, you know, we use silica to store information that theoretically any vibration that has hit a rock uh, has made a slight imprint. Now it's almost impossible for us to ever pick that up with current technology, but perhaps, you know, on some subtle level, and maybe it's the, the development of the, the human form itself or our minds or, or whatever, I don't know, but uh, it, it gives me just the inkling that there, there might be ways of living far mm -hmm. more in tune with nature that don't make this big uh, technological and structural imprint. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I do think, uh, um, and it, you touch upon this point, uh, that uh, very often we make the mistake uh, of uh, looking for us or for a replica of our civilization in the past, right? So uh -huh. we can't even conceive uh, of a civilization that may be even equally scientifically or spiritually advanced uh, that does not possess the same type of uh, 
civilization or material culture or technology that we have nowadays. So even an advanced civilization may, be complete, may go completely unnoticed uh, if uh, they were, for instance, not building large stone structures or the type of things uh, the archaeologists are typically looking for. I think a prime example of that is what is just now being uncovered in the Amazon, where we, we are finding literally enormous earthworks, uh, gigantic uh, uh, structures that have been buried, in some cases even for thousands of years, uh, in the forest. They have gone completely unnoticed to archaeologists just because they were built, as you say, probably more in tune with nature, with organic materials. So these are not the type of things that would leave uh, uh, remnants so easily identified in the archaeological record as a stone metal, for instance, would be. It's very hard for us to picture a civilization that did not have that type of technology. Yes, yes. So I like your point. You know, we're always looking for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if if we don't find the type of computers that we use, the type of communication <laughs> devices that we use, then we just assume, well, they couldn't have been more advanced because they didn't have our stuff. And I remember having this very conversation with somebody, it was close to 40 years ago now. And um, and he was saying, okay, where are all their telephone wires? You know, how, how come we don't find this stuff all over the world if there was really an advanced civilization? Oh. And then I was thinking, yeah, we should find more of that. And then, you know, a couple of decades go by and everything's going wireless. Yeah. And now I realize Wi Fi <laughs> yeah. or something even beyond that. Who, who knows? Yeah. But you're right. We, tend to uh, dismiss or denigrate the accomplishments of the Asian, ancients if it doesn't quite fit our current yeah. viewpoint. Yeah. I think this is something that also applies up uh, to the field of uh, ancient uh, ancient technology, ancient stonework. When you see some of the engineering uh, realizations of these ancient societies, if you look at uh, the pyramids, for instance, or the kind of stonework we find in places like Peru or Mexico, even uh, which is like very puzzling and would be very difficult to reproduce uh, with uh, our modern tools. So they almost. Uh, um, prompts the question as to whether these cultures uh, they did uh, possess perhaps another type, another form of technology that allowed them to manipulate stone uh, to move a very large mass of stone without using the mechanical methods that uh, we would use today. Yes, yes, that's interesting. I, it's a big mystery, and you do seem to find some stone in some areas that appears to be almost melted. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I know there's a little bit of myth about, you know, using plants to change the nature right. of stone, but yeah, we're, we're not there yet, but it could be that, that mm -hmm. we do discover something like that. And then we say, oh, of course they, they knew about this. They must've stumbled across it mm -hmm. somehow earlier, you know, Gobekli Tepe, which, which you had mentioned, uh, Marco, you know, that probably wouldn't even exist had it not been purposely buried. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Robert Schock's a good friend, and he's uh, told us about, you know, when they did the excavation, that you can tell the way the soil's laid, whether or not it was natural from, you know, millions of years ago or whether it was filled in pretty easily. And it was obviously filled in, obviously buried, and uh, thank God it was. <laughs> we wouldn't be looking at that because after 10,000 years, those stones themselves would be sand once right. again. Yeah, you must always think about how much has been lost because at the end of the day, it's almost as if a future archaeologist were trying to reconstruct the history of our civilization based on a few gravestones in a, in a country cemetery and uh, just some like straps of, uh, of, of trash. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult, uh, very difficult uh, to, to put together the evidence. And there's always uh, with a... a in general, not, not only in archaeology, but in science, uh, um, absence of evidence should never be taken for evidence of absence. So there are many examples <laughs> in archaeology uh, of that. So just think about how the paradigm has shifted a number of times as new technologies become available, as also our knowledge of already known sites increases. We're constantly discovering new things about uh, the ancient past. Yes. Yeah. It's wonderful. So yeah, LIDAR has just 
come along in the last decade or so, and it's it's opening our eyes to a great degree. And I'm sure there'll be other technologies like that. So we're no longer dependent on on finding a piece of rock to determine whether or not somebody was there. Yeah, the many more ways. So that, right. I think there's an exciting future there for archaeology. Um, as you mentioned, uh, you use the the term uh, empires plural. Uh, in your book, and uh, you know, I've heard this this thought that okay, Atlantis was somewhere in the Atlantic, and therefore you're going to find evidence on the edges of that. Uh, what what do you think is some of the best evidence to be found that, or is that your viewpoint that that that's where Atlantis was, or is maybe we even need to back up? Is Atlantis just a term for all higher age cultures or, or was it a specific place in your opinion yeah i do think it was a specific place uh, and uh, i do think it was most likely located in the mid-atlantic ocean so that's the location to which uh, uh plato's accounts uh points to as well as many other mythical traditions from both sides of the atlantic actually both from ancient egypt uh, mesopotamia as well as from uh, from mesoamerica so i think there is a like very strong uh, uh, hints uh, uh, or evidence uh, that that was the location of uh, these uh, uh, ancient uh, advanced uh, civilization. Now, I think uh, that some of the most compelling evidence uh, for a mid-Atlantic civilization is represented by the so-called Sea People invasion. So this is something I also discuss uh, in the book. Uh, my view, actually, of the destruction of the fall of these high civilization is not that it vanished in a single day and night. Uh, I think this is a very important point. Clearly, a civilization that was up so advanced, uh, so accomplished, uh, could not have just simply disappeared. Uh, for how, uh, independent of how devastating that cataclysm might have been. So, what it, what it suggests is rather that the survivors from that civilization, they in a way attempted to rebuild that civilization. In some cases, they settled on uh, the lands on both sides of the Atlantic, in the old world, and in the new world. And that these uh, migrations were essentially prompted by geological instability in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I actually uh, dedicate uh, a couple of chapters in the book uh, to discuss uh, the question of uh, the geological instability in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, where there is, I think, very strong evidence of uh, various episodes of uh, subsidence of the Mid-Atlantic region separated by thousands of years. So Based you... on the rift that goes uh, down right. the middle of the Atlantic? Right. There? Correct. So there is evidence that at some point, the large chunks of the Mid-Atlantic region, very much like the Azores today, were above water and that they sunk uh, as a result of cataclysmic events. So there were probably periods of very slow and gradual sinking, followed by very rapid sinking in which the Mid-Atlantic region would have quite literally fallen by uh, dozens, if not hundreds of meters in a single episode. Uh, and so that would, have, of course, have triggered massive migrations of people from these mid-Atlantic centers. And if you correlate these episodes of geological instability in the mid-Atlantic Ocean to the pattern of sea people invasions, at least for what we can know over the last 10,000 years or so since the Cro-Magnon migrations down to the later Bronze Age sea people migrations, you can find a very strong correlation between uh, these episodes. And by the way, I don't think that this process has stopped uh, 10 thousand or eleven thousand years ago as Plato says I think that this sinking of the mid-Atlantic region continued well into the European Bronze Age uh, of course uh, by that point in time it would have been a much more diminished civilization but I do think that uh, all these uh, migration that nobody has ever been able uh, whose origin nobody has ever been able to uh, to properly identify the so-called sea people migration at some point uh, entering to the Mediterranean, into Egypt. I think that these had a mid-Atlantic origin and they were essentially some late remnants from, uh, uh, you can call it Atlantis, or this mid-Atlantic civilization. Hmm. Yes. Uh, going as far forward as the Phoenicians, would they be considered a I see people. Actually, I think that many of the classical civilizations of the Phoenicians, uh, uh, the Egyptians, they inherited aspects of uh, the culture of these uh, these 
lost civilization. So think about the Phoenicians for all their knowledge of uh, uh, navigation, cartography. I think a lot of that may be traced back to these uh, mid-Atlantic culture. And then if you also look uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, at ancient Mesoamerica, South America, you have a very similar accounts of uh, the arrival of uh, various peoples from the sea, all these uh, civilization bringers like Quetzalcoatl, like Viracocha, for instance, in South America. They were almost invariably said to have come from the east and have uh, created these great civilizations of the Toltecs, of the Incas in, in South America. So again, I think there is a like, strong evidence uh, that uh, uh, there may be a common origin for the civilizations of the old and the new world, and that origin may be found in a now sunken mid-Atlantic landmass. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've I've tried to read everything I could on uh, geology ab about the Mid Atlantic, and uh, I think m most of the geologists I talk to just say they have a very difficult time dating things, and and you know for good reason. <laughs> things are at the bottom of the sea, and it's and covered with you know who knows how much uh, silt and sand, and and so yeah, it's going to be really a difficult task to to do some dating there, but, um, you know. They do think uh, that just, just because of what you're saying is going to be extremely difficult. So uh, I, I think it's probably still beyond our technological capabilities to uncover any any direct evidence of that. Because uh, as you say, uh, these uh, ruins or these remnants uh, would have now spent uh, thousands of years at the bottom of the ocean, uh, probably buried under hundreds of meters of sediments, uh, lava flows. It would be extremely hard to recover anything. Of course, there is always a hope that on some isolated uh, underwater mountain, some ruins will be found. Uh, but but I think it's going to be a major endeavor and probably beyond the capabilities of our current technology. That's why I think that our best chance at finding evidence of this civilization is just looking for the survivors. Where did they go? What civilizations they created, uh, both in the old world and the new world? And that's why I'm so interested in this question of uh, how these civilizations, how these cultures originated, which uh, seem to have uh, a reason almost already fully formed. Uh, this is something you see in Egypt. Egypt, for instance, in Mesopotamia, where these civilizations almost uh, appear with uh, a perfectly uh, structured calendar, a system of writing, a monumental architecture, without the period of evolution that you would expect, as if that evolution had somehow occurred elsewhere. This exactly. is something you find also in, uh, in Mesoamerica with, with the Olmecs. They are now the earliest known civilization of, uh, of Mesoamerica. And again, the Olmecs appear as if out of nowhere with a uh, perfectly developed calendar, mathematics, including concept of zero, uh, very advanced uh, astronomy, uh, writing system, and we haven't yet found uh, any evidence of a cultural development that they may have led to these inventions. That's that's beautiful, um, the, the way you, you put it. Um, it reminds me actually of John Anthony West, you know, it's a good old friend, spoke at many of our conferences, and uh, he was, even though he studied this stuff for his lifetime, he was continually astounded at how much the Egyptians knew and how it seems to be the most pristine, the most perfect, the farther back you go in history. And he and he he just wanted to shout that message, you know, from the top of his lungs, which I actually think he did a pretty good job of, although it it goes so hard against this Darwinian thought that, you know, anything that came before us must be more primitive. So you're a fool to even think that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but now to find that there may be a similar pattern in the uh, Western hemisphere, uh, Mesoamerican cultures, I think that's what you're on to. That's mm -hmm. so exciting. And if you can really start to document that, then then i think mainstream archaeology has to take another look at at this whole idea of cycles absolutely i, I do think that we need to find uh, both the the, ar the archaeological evidence as well as the cultural evidence uh, for that i think from a cultural point of view we have uh, 
many, uh, I would consider almost uh, as a scientific out of place artifacts in a way. So if you think about uh, the Maya calendar, which now, by the way, we know it's not Maya, it, was, it originated a thousand years earlier with the Olmec. But even, even with that, uh, with something of- is, is that true? Is that documented now? That, that yes, yes. Did. Okay. did originate with the Olmecs. Um, at least like the earliest dates uh, that were expressed in the long count system were found at all my sites, La Mocarra, and uh, is it recently uncovered even earlier in the highlands of central Mexico, which I think is a very fascinating question, like where did the, the calendar originate? Interesting, and the, yeah. And the, what, what you find is that this incredibly complex machine, uh, there was the Mesoamerican calendar with all these different, uh, you could almost picture it as a set of spinning wheels almost, cycles of time spanning tens of thousands of years, a system of numerical and mathematical calculation that included the concept of zero, could express quantities in the order of millions or billions. To think that that was developed or apparently appeared as if out of nowhere 3,000 years ago, uh, out of the jungle, quite literally, I think it really suggests that uh, there are probably many pages, not many chapters of the history of Mesoamerica that are now completely lost. And then the other yes. piece is, uh, is the archaeological evidence. Uh, I think uh, we also need to make an effort to uncover the archaeological evidence uh, for these earlier cultural developments. And they do believe that much of that can be uncovered in Mesoamerica. There are many areas of Mesoamerica that have never seen the spade of an archaeologist uh, that include large parts of Mexico, large parts of uh, Guatemala. And this is where I think that people should be looking for the evidence of these uh, like pre olmec pre-Maya Mesoamerican civilization. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, in my heart, I really hope for a national treasure type of moment. You know, I love that movie with Nicolas Cage where they they track down this old, you know, uh, treasure trove there. I think it's hiding in, in New York somewhere, right? That's right, yeah. That's where they find the treasure. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I I hope, and I I think there's actually some chance that you know maybe it's not treasure, but to me even more important would be a, a codex or or just trove of of records of what what their cultures were really like long long ago. And let's let's hope there's something deep down there somewhere as they get to investigate all these sites that have been discovered by lidar. Right. Right now, one of my, um, I would say probably like the most important project I'm working on right oh. now is a geophysical survey of an archaeological site in southeastern Mexico called Mitla. Uh, at Mitla, we conducted uh, with help from the Mexican National Institute of History and Anthropology and the National Autonomous University of Mexico, a complete geophysical survey of the site uh, where there was a, a longer tradition of subterranean chambers and tunnels. And we have now positive evidence of a vast network of uh, subterranean chambers, uh, tunnels, passageways uh, extending to a very considerable depth uh, into the ground. And the reason why I think it's a very fascinating site is that Mitla has a combination of many different elements. It has megalithic architecture. It's probably one of the most impressive megalithic sites in all of Mexico, dating back over 2,000, possibly 3,000 years. And what it's form are the megaliths in? Is it pyramids or large what size blocks what sort of it's thing a, it's a, it's a it's a combination there are some huge architectural stone blocks that are used as lintels as monolithic columns in buildings some of which are over six or seven meters long so weighting in the range of 30 to 50 tons these are actually some of the largest megalithic stone blocks uh, ever employed in architecture in mesoamerica and there are subterranean chambers. Uh, there are only two subterranean chambers that have been explored and have been known since the 1800s uh, at Mitla. Uh, they're of comparatively small size, uh, much smaller than what the geophysical survey has uh, identified. But their construction technique is extremely sophisticated. They're also built of huge megalithic, uh, perfectly fitted stone blocks. And they may belong to the earliest uh, layers of construction at the site. 
Now, what I, what I find particularly fascinating uh, personally about Mitla is the fact that it's probably one of the oldest continuously inhabited places in the Americas. So we have a sequence of civilization in Mitla that goes back almost 10,000 years. So, uh, Mitla and uh, the area around Mitla is the place where agriculture was first developed in the American continent. A lot of our modern crops and foodstuffs, including corn, including beans, uh, squash, they were first domesticated in Mitla. Actually, the earliest mm. evidence of corn domestication comes from a cave. Uh, called Gila Nakish, uh, located just three kilometers to the north of Mitla. So you have this combination of early development of agriculture, megalithic structures, and potentially a vast uh, underground subterranean complex uh, at the site that I believe uh, may hold many of the answers to the origins of Mesoamerican civilization. We're still uh, just at the beginning of uh, this research. So for the time being, we've conducted this research with geophysical methods, including ground penetrating radar, seismic scans uh, that have uh, actually revealed uh, the existence of this vast uh, subterranean complex. Uh, uh, and now we look... Uh, for... And you're doing this through your research institute? Yes, yes, yes. I actually founded uh, in uh, 2020 a research association. It's called the Arts Project, uh, uh, which is organized as a foundation uh, incorporated as a nonprofit in Mexico with the purpose of promoting uh, archaeological research and exploration, uh, leveraging some of these new technologies, including Wonderful. methods and, uh, and lighter. So this is one of our largest projects at the moment. Uh, we'll be down there again in September of this year. Hopefully there will be new discoveries uh, being made uh, there and we hope that after this uh, first phase of geophysical uh, scans we'll actually be able to conduct uh, if not a full-scale excavation at least uh, to drill into these chambers insert a camera and see what is truly down there ah fantastic yeah, i look forward to hearing there's that a, so there's a treasure yeah a treasure of some sort that's all treasure right <laughs> uh so good maybe you'll have some preliminary findings by the time you're appearing at the conference in october oh, Wonderful, wonderful. We're very excited to have you at this year's conference. Yes, yeah, yeah, really. You, you bring a, a nice, uh, fresh element to it. So thank you for that uh, that work you do. Um, so, you know, some of the researchers uh, that I talk to, myself included, uh, are, we almost get pushed into you know, studying a little bit of metaphysics uh, along with, you know, the hard research, and it's it's of course it's even softer science, um, but it seems that you know ancient cultures, you know, weren't just all about the physical that they they felt more connected to the stars. At least that's what much of the mythology seems to show, and uh, you know, you mentioned uh, legacy of some of these. Uh, civilizations. C can you talk about what are your thoughts on this general idea? I don't want to get too woo woo or anything, but that's good. Yeah, I think it's almost inevitable when you approach this question about uh, ancient civilizations, uh, the problem of Atlantis, uh, to also step into, as I say, like the metaphysics or like the, the, the esoteric side, uh, let me say. And this is actually something that uh, I discuss at length uh, in my book uh, is that is what I think particularly about Atlantis. I think this is a concept that lives uh, in between the realm of science uh, and the realm of uh, esotericism. There is so much has been written on this concept of ancient lost civilizations uh, since, uh, since, uh, since a very long time ago. And then more recently in uh, theosophy, for instance, uh, in various uh, like mystery schools and mystery traditions, there is always this idea that it is ancient civilizations were not only more scientifically, maybe technologically advanced, but they were also more spiritually advanced. So in a way, closer to the gods, uh, uh, if you want, uh, which uh, may have different interpretations, right? There is, a, I think, uh, a more literal interpretation of that concept, uh, as if like these uh, civilization, in a way, they had 
uh, let me call it like a divine component in that we can discuss uh, about what uh, what exactly we we mean by that. But let's 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 call it like an external influence, uh, um, perhaps. Uh, but then there is also this idea that these civilization were more in tune with nature, more in tune with energies than now with our materialistic uh, technological society. We barely understand. Yes, yes, uh, it's uh, and some of this esoteric knowledge, which is fascinating, uh, has been sort of uh, exculpated uh, or cut out from, you know, pure science, uh, because you know, just coming out of the Renaissance, especially, we had to be very practical to know uh, to invent things. Um, but it was almost too cut out, and so now you have. St- pure science over here that doesn't even want to discuss anything to do with spiritual thought or religion or anything like that. Uh, and then, then this other side that does look at esoteric metaphysical thought, but is not really accepted very well in the scientific community. And I think that's another schism that I hope can come together, you know, as we evolve as right. Right. I don't think there is also a parting shift happening uh, right now as we speak in in the field of science. Uh, I think we're moving from a, a parting in which if it cannot be measured, it doesn't exist, uh, to a new parting with with quantum physics, uh, for instance, uh, entanglement, uh, uh, all those studies on the impact of consciousness on the physical world and physical reality that, in a way, I think they're already bordering into, into metaphysics. Yes, yes, that's exciting. Yeah. And I know, of course, quantum uh, mechanics has been around for quite some time, but the the implications, you know, that something doesn't exist unless it's observed or at least doesn't exist in a solid state. When we talk about how much did the ancients really know? Yeah, I'm not just interested in, you know, how they moved great stones or or things like this. I, I'm I really want to go deeper. And um there, there's a book out, uh Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, uh, by uh, John Burke, and he spoke at a few conferences. He's since passed away. Uh, but he had worked at Monsanto for a while and he studied seeds, and he found out that uh if you stress a seed, uh or a batch of seeds, then that batch of seeds will have a higher propagation rate than a group of seeds that is, has not been stressed. Uh, and so it's just like a muscle. A muscle is going to be better and stronger if it's if it's challenged and it goes through stress. And uh, so they did this in the uh, laboratory, but he had been very interested in esoteric uh, subjects. And he had read once uh, at a and I think it was a Mayan site that, you know, people would uh, take their seeds to the top of the pyramid or the temple to be blessed before they planted them. And he he was thinking about this and the way they stressed the seeds at Monsanto when he was there was they would actually give them a, a very light electrical charge, not enough to hurt them, but enough to, so that this batch, they'll have 90% propagation versus the unstressed batch will have maybe 50% or whatever. Which is, which is, by the way, I think one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by uh, ancient Mesoamerican civilizations is the fact that these civilizations are still very much alive. Uh, it's not uh, a dead civilization like ancient Egypt, uh, but uh, of course, like uh, there was the, the tragedy of the conquest uh, that eradicated oh. so much of ancient culture from, from the region. But many of these traditions, they're still kept alive uh, by uh, local like groups, uh, by local elders, uh, shamans in various parts of Central or South America, maybe in a degraded way, at least compared to the height uh, that this civilization may have reached. Uh, but still, like uh, there are many of these rituals, many of these traditions are still kept alive in many parts of Mexico and Central America. Well, thank God for the indigenous people, yeah, because they seem to keep alive some of these things that I think we'll find out in time that they're very valuable to us. Um, yeah, just finishing quickly with John Burke's work. So he he noticed that, you know, if you build a s- stone in the sh- a shape of a large mount over a ge- geophysical discontinuity under the earth, uh, where, say, water is running, you know, moving electrons, um, 
that when that that part of the earth turns to face the sun, you know, the the sun's uh uh output uh sort of ripples the the geomagnetic uh the magnetosphere of the earth and you'll see it bend it there you've seen mm-hmm. these diagrams i'm sure and so he used uh ground electrodes and find out that indeed there's actual charge being given at many of these sites on top of the temples and and pyramids and um so he thinks that somehow maybe they didn't explain it in our terms but somehow some of the ancient cultures knew this and so there was a very good reason for them to take seeds to a certain temple or or site because they were actually benefiting right yeah. no i do think there is a, still a lot that we need to learn about why exactly some of these monuments were built to where they are how the ancients uh, aligned their structures uh, of course very similar to the concept of uh, ley lines uh, for instance or like the lines of the dragon in asia uh, there's also something very similar in, in mesoamerica where you can find that many of these ancient structures they are aligned very often over hundreds of uh, of kilometers uh, in some cases they were built on top of a uh, significant uh, uh, features like subterranean rivers, uh, subterranean caves. Uh, one one recent example is they discovered this massive uh, water cavern underneath the Castillo Pyramid in, in Chichen Itza. This, uh, this massive cenote that was again discovered with geophysical methods, and nobody had any idea that pyramid had been built on top of that vast water-filled cavity. It's even doubtful the ancient uh, even could have had direct knowledge of that because it's buried so deep uh, under the ground. But clearly they be able to the pyramid on that spot for a reason clearly yeah and maybe they knew in ways that aren't mm-hmm. apparent to us now right. sure yeah yeah you know these uh there's some wonderful stories in the indian culture about uh these different ages and just broken into four to make it mm-hmm. sort of easy to organize them in in our mind uh which you know the Greeks for the iron, brown, silver, and golden to the Indians, the uh, Kali, Dwapara, Tretan, Satya Yugas. Uh, but yeah, they 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 say with you know uniformity that the this these higher ages, like the Treta Yuga, you know, is uh, mankind really understands a subtle energy. Uh, you know, it's a pre-Babel age before writing is required, is the way they put it. And I and I love that, you know, because because we think, oh, writing is the advancement of of man, and yet so many of these great ancient structures were built before there's writing. Right. You know, how can they do that? You know, isn't it supposed to be absolutely required to have any large organization? And uh, again, you know, the mind goes to these yuga stories, and they must have known something we didn't know for sure. Yeah, I think there is almost this idea of uh, like an innate uh, natural knowledge or that uh, maybe uh, people in earlier times had this uh, ability to tap into some universal consciousness or some universal source uh, of uh, knowledge. Uh, and that's a capability that we have uh, since uh, lost with uh, with the passing of time. Um, there's also, I think, a very interesting passage uh, in, uh, in Plato. If you think about these ancient uh, Greek mystery schools that are almost... Uh, uh, made a point of refusing to committing uh, their secret teachings to writing uh, because uh, they thought that writing was just uh, in a way like a decadent form of just fixing uh, what should be just a uh, natural knowledge that should come to, to the individual through, you can call it like metaphysical or supernatural means. Yes, yes. And that carried over into uh, Islam. You know, they the most sacred teachings uh, like the Quran it was not put in writing until very recent times. And, uh, and of course, they, they need to keep up with everybody else. <laughs> Better marketing, I guess, if it's in writing. But you're right. You do lose something. I know, uh, like f- certain prayers, uh, you know, you can, when you memorize them and think about them, and uh, they kind of seep into the heart a little bit versus if you're just reading it off the page and not thinking about it, you, you lose some of, some of what's there. Right, right. And that's why I think uh, it's very hard for, for, for us to imagine a civilization uh, that uh, could be 
advanced uh, in a way without possessing uh, that uh, type of uh, writing. And I think there are many examples from the Americas. One is, uh, is Teotihuacan, it was probably the most powerful ancient state in, in central Mexico. And uh, not a single Teotihuacan inscription has ever been found. Uh, similar really? Also- to the Incas in South America, they seemingly manage an empire as vast as the Roman Empire without a, a form of writing, except maybe for this like not system that's never been 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 deciphered. So I think it's very well possible to build an entire civilization, even an advanced civilization, without uh, something that we consider as fundamental as writing. Right. So yeah, your your point is there's some kind of communication going mm-hmm. on. Uh, just because it's not in writing doesn't mean they're not not organizing mm-hmm. yeah not communicating right. yeah very 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 good point uh so so uh really there's no writing at that side huh no, Teotihuacan, uh, in, uh, which is a, a, a bit of a paradox because by then uh, the Olmecs clearly had developed uh, already in a thousand years earlier, a system of writing, the Mayas by then uh, had some form of Maya hieroglyphs, the Zapotex. Yet Teotihuacan it was the most important uh, mm-hmm. uh, classic city in ancient Mesoamerica at the time. They probably reached a population of 250,000, uh, built massive pyramids. Uh, not massive, a yeah. Inscription have, has been found at Teotihuacan, which is a bit of a mystery. Uh, clearly, they knew. Uh, about writing because all the people around them with whom they interacted they possess writing uh, but for some reason they never committed uh, that to monuments or to codices or anything that uh, archaeologists could find fascinating it, it, this is the site where the the three pyramids are lined up very similar to the Giza moon. plateau exactly exactly yeah yeah so the, it's the largest structures and no evidence of writing Amazing. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Good. Well, what's, uh, what's on your future plans? Where's, where's your work going? Well, I think uh, right now, as I mentioned with uh, these uh, uh, research association that I lead uh, in Mexico called the Arts Project, uh, we're now working on two main uh, projects. So one uh, is uh, the geophysical study of Mitla that I mentioned. And there will be, I will be again, like down there in September for the second phase of the geophysical study. Uh, another project that we hope to kick off uh, next year is at a site called San Miguel Ixtapan in central Mexico, where we have recently discovered some uh, incredible megalithic stonework, uh, very similar to what you find in South America, places like Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, uh, totally unknown. There is no documentation whatsoever. Uh, 